Hey, welcome back guys. The Apex Predator has finally revealed himself on both fronts as Tariq sets out to finally accept his destiny as a candidate pursuing the job of the biggest drug dealer in New York, even at the expense of his newfound family. But as the great Jay-Z once said, you gotta learn to live with regrets. And in the second half of Power Ghost's final season, we'll learn whether or not Tariq will win it all or crap out like his father before. I'm here to break it all down in typical top 10 WTF fashion. Before we begin, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and bell notification to immediately receive these videos. Also, big thank you to all of my channel donors. If you'd like to be the next one, drop a dollar on that cash app for us. And lastly, a spoiler alert is now in effect for all things power. Here we go. WTF moment number 10, Busted. The episode kicks off recapping the carnal field night before, displaying Tariq's latest clapathon with his new and highly forbidden muse, Anya. After the two exchange morning niceties, Anya returns home only to be confronted by Noma for yet again evading security. As she rebuts her mother's concern while ruffling through her purse, a small bag of work drops out. Anya downplays the occurrence and unknowingly reveals the drug's source in front of her homicidal maniac mother, who would later question Effie's potential involvement and later pull up to Stansfield herself for a more troubling answer. WTF moment number nine, a matter of trust. Braden meets with Zion to re-up on product when the unstable drug lord begins to question him on trust, the Russians, and their current business status despite being dried out of product. Zion, hoping to take over their territory, demands an answer from Braden, who folds under pressure and drops Noma's name. This gesture is reciprocated by a crazy yet good faith hug from Zion, the kind that Damon once pulled on Craig and Day Day in Friday After Next. Though Tiny Tommy survived this exchange, it leaves one to wonder just what Zion's larger play is, because once he sniffs out this information, his later actions revolve around seizing territory and keeping outsiders at a distance. What is Zion's true ambition and motivation? I guess we shall see. WTF moment number eight, leverage in the third degree. Noma, after receiving intel from Anya and Effie regarding the unknown product bag, surprisingly pulls up to Stansfield with Kane and questions Tariq about the baggie and agreement violation that he wouldn't serve in order to maintain their troops. Kane, having previous knowledge of Tariq's distribution tactics from seasons past, discovers hard evidence of Reek's system in the midst of his deceptions, and the two force him towards the door for certain death. However, just when the shit and the fan are having that one conversation, Anya arrives, and Tariq uses her appearance as leverage against Noma. Understanding that maintaining secrecy of occupation in her daughter's eyes is absolutely paramount to the British queen pin. The look in Noma's eyes during this sequence is absolutely hilarious though, especially when Tariq begins his patronizing routine. Look how badly she wants to kill this nigga. A classic moment, no doubt. Also, don't miss the final line between Reek and Kane, where the latter says that, quote, I'll see you soon. And Tariq responds with, sure will. Definitely an allusion to a showdown for the ages to come. WTF moment number seven, brotherhood blow up. Immediately following the near loss of his life, Tariq finds Brayden in the back of their party, his face buried in coat. Tariq furiously rebukes Brayden for not just his drug usage, but Elle's knowledge of their supposed secret operation. Brayden lies to Tariq about how she knows of their scheme, adding more fuel to their fiery dispute. Tariq charges Brayden with not being built for the game, but Brayden accurately points out the sacrifices he's made for Tariq over the course of the series, and even more so what has cost him, giving both Tariq and the viewing audience insight into why he's so susceptible to drug use in the first place. Though both make valid points throughout the argument, it ends with them at odds like only brothers could be. WTF moment number six, ego death. Brayden gets back to his room in the aftermath of his heated argument with Tariq, and Elle seeks to comfort him with some very discomforting information. She dropped acid in Tariq's water bottle in retaliation for his remarks against her during the heated exchange. Brayden immediately rebukes Elle for this treachery and rushes to Tariq's aid only to find him completely outside of his mind and seriously tripping balls. The negative moment does turn out to be a positive for Tariq, however, as it provides him with the clarity that he evaded his father in regards to his chosen path. Remember, Ghost was knee-deep in the game when he suddenly decided he wanted out. But with every move he made towards legitimacy, there was a street-induced consequence that he had to suffer through. Tariq, on the other hand, decides from the outset that the best way forward is at the top of the game, whatever may come. And through the images provided by this acid trip slash ego death episode, he's able to finally come to terms with his true self. Even reliving his greatest sin against his family, the death of his father, through his own perspective on both sides of that gun, 
This moment was heavy and deserving of a frame by frame breakdown all its own, so definitely stay tuned for that. Also, keep in mind that Brandon lied to Tariq once again after he awakened from this acid trip in an effort to protect Elle. All this points towards a certain demise for the songstress, as she's already overstepped and her very presence jeopardizes the foundation of Tariq and Brayden's brotherhood. Women who pose such a threat in the power verse never last. Just ask Holly Weaver. WTF moment number five, window seat. Norma meets with Wiley Adams in order to further talk business interests when they're interrupted by a waitress attempting to move them due to a prior reservation. That reservation appears in the form of Zion, who uses the table as a metaphor against Noma for her peddling product in his city, territory, and backyard. He cautions her against continuing the disrespectful act and offers her a unique view of the city from another table away from the one he just claimed. This moment put the usually dominant Noma on the opposite ends of the power spectrum, simultaneously embarrassing her while temporarily endangering her business endeavors with Wap. WTF moment number four, fight for New York. After informing Kane and Davis of the Zion incident, Kane brings Noma to Z's fight club to check the mid-level dealer for disrespecting his work. Zion offers further disrespect in the face of the checking, and Kane, having had enough of Z's foolishness, invites him to his hands via the ring. Then, Noma watches on as the elder Tahada turns Zion into a nice, in-pocket bitch in front of his own crowd. Zion then attempts to cheat by implementing brass knuckles into the fight, something Dougie Fresh, hip-hop legend extraordinaire, was absolutely not happy. He quickly intervenes and crowns Kane the winner, much to Zion's chagrin. But hey, one embarrassment deserves another, I suppose. WTF moment number three, pleasures unforeseen. Unforeseen to who? Because for me, I saw this shit coming five miles away. But anyway, on the tail end of her previously jeopardized deal with Wiley Adams, courtesy of Zion, Davis pulls up to inform Noma that he secured the deal in spite of the embarrassing event. Noma shows appreciation to Davis for solidifying her position in the legitimate world, offering him a drink, a toast, and most notably, those cheeks. Now, if you've been following my power tweets, and you should, you'll notice that I openly called this one. The tension between them was simply too omnipresent not to be acted upon. This will make things interesting with Kane, however, as he won't take too kindly to another dog marking his favorite fire hydrant, if you know what I mean, especially after literally fighting for her honor in the same evening. But for Noma, her logic is simple. Davis is my representative in the professional world, and Kane is my man in the underworld. Women are sparked by the qualities of both, and in cases where they can't observe the two qualities in one man, they'll rock out with two men, each containing one quality. Also, Noma's choosy nature here isn't surprising. After all, she did kill her own baby father a season ago, so the furthest thing from her character's archetype is loyalty. Too bad for Kane, he's the very definition of the term. WTF moment number two, allow me to reintroduce myself. Monet appeals to Drew in an attempt to repair their familial bonds, trying to leverage any lingering sympathy for a path of re-entry into the game after being left for dead in the drug business by Kane and Noma. Drew agrees to help Monet hit a final lick in order to re-establish herself in the business, while also taking a cut for himself in order to finally pursue his artistic endeavors. That lick would come at Noma's expense though, as they gather a couple of guys to rob Noma's shipment and subsequently go their separate ways. However, the two would be surprisingly forced back into business together by none other than Detective Carter, who would intercept the group in the midst of the felonious caper and reveal himself as a player on both sides of the legal coin, allowing drug dealing and murder to commence so long as not one innocent soul is harmed in the process. This revelation further explains Carter's shady tactics with Kamal in the previous episode, redirecting serious leads in favor of recruiting more pawns for his grander, illegal street game. Carter's bombshell disclosure is accompanied by a fatal act of violence to further drive home to a shock Drew and Monet that he's not fucking around. And he murders both of their unnamed assailants in cold blood, with the latter victim being identified by the filthy detective as a violator of the innocence clause within street dealings, and thus expendable by law, literally. This is a major game changer for Ghost's final season, and is something I previously, and accurately no less, predicted in this video, in case you missed it. Carter's now locked down the services of Monet, along with that mandatory 35% kickback for services allowed. But he's coming for his bigger, and dare I say, more prized fish in Tariq for the second half of the final season. So until September arrives, we will all be waiting and patiently anticipating his next maneuver. And WTF moment number one, 
you're in equals I'm out. In the final sequence we'll get for the next two months, Tariq accompanies Diana to her ultrasound appointment. She shares with Reek that she wants to name a potential son after her father, Lorenzo, then questions him about the fate of Selene. Tariq clearly lies, yet refuses self-implication, similar to his father in the Terry Silver debacle back in OG Power. Following Diana's continued declarations to raise her child outside of the life, Tariq attempts to ease her apprehensions by rationalizing his own ambitions against his father's shortcomings. Tariq arrives to the conclusion that committing 10 toes into the game, as opposed to the one foot in, one foot out model that cost Ghost his life, is the best way to ensure his new family's safety, surmising that 10 toes will propel him to the top of the game, where he can thereby guarantee security and strength. Ironically, this is the same way that Noma rules her empire, and we see what has cost her family a relationship with her daughter, Anya. And if that's not enough, Diana has experienced this dynamic firsthand with Monet and Lorenzo, who although weren't at the top of the entire game per se, were on top of their own hustle and family, the latter of which suffering mightily due to the wages of their street sin. Understanding that there's no changing his mind and staunchly opposed to repeating her own dark family history, Diana opts to lead Tariq to his own demonic devices, choosing a virtuous future over a tragic one. Some lingering thoughts before we end today's video. At the top of 405, Diana is shown trying to contact Selene, but to no avail. How will she respond once Tariq's role in his disappearance levels up from speculation to confirmation? It'll likely submit her decision to walk away from him so long as he's in the game, or worse, if it comes down to Tariq's involvement or his freedom. That coin flip won't end well for the newly ambitious Junior St. Patrick. While we're on Diana, her exchange in the church with the wiser elder parallels Tariq's moment of clarity. While his epiphany clarifies the darkness of his soul, Diana's highlights the light of her very own and solidifies her decision to not only keep the baby, but part ways with any person, thing, or influence that would sully it. Last point on Diana, her admitting to only sleeping with Tariq unprotected speaks volumes to her former desire for him. Throughout the Ghost series, we witnessed the cat and mouse relationship between the two, and at one point, they were perceived to be the Peter Parker and Mary Jane of this series in the eyes of yours truly. Assuming Diana brings a healthy baby to term, that certainly cannot be ruled out, and whatever underlying love that brought Diana to trust to read that much is still lingering within her very soul, even at the height of her betrayals against them, as crazy as that sounds. L's sickle cell diagnosis was revealed to us this episode. I wonder how it would be used against her in the second half. Remember, she poisoned Tariq during this episode. Would he return the favor once he discovers her part in it, even tampering with her pills to deadly effect, similar to how Walter White did Jane with Jesse? Or worse, even denying her her medication after some unpardonable action by the unstable new character. I can definitely see something tragic like that occurring this fall. Hey, did y'all peep that psychopath Detective Carter talking to his dead wife as if she's alive in the home? Or was it just me? That fool is crazy, <laughs> but that shit was hilarious. And lastly, I did say last week that Davis was gonna crack Noma, didn't I? I didn't know it would be this soon, but all the signs were there as the two began advancing their business and semi-personal relationship. The scene where Davis and Kane go back and forth on how to solve the Zion problem is critical to predicting just where their budding love triangle may end up, and is definitely leaning towards the negative for Davis, who although may end up in the second half of the season, isn't prominently mentioned throughout any of the descriptions lingering online. Fingers crossed for our beloved, yet beleaguered former counselor. But that'll do it for this one. What were your thoughts on the Power Ghost Season 4 mid-season finale? Be sure to drop me your opinions in the comments below. As always, I thank you for watching today's video. If you liked today's video, go ahead and drop a dollar on that cash app for us, hit the like button, share it with your friends who are power fans, and subscribe for more content such as this. This is Rudy P. Magic of Rudy P. Magic Beats, and have a blessed one until the next one. Peace, y'all.